The last part of this chapter is about time. We'll begin by looking at the different representations of time in Linux and the conversions that you can perform between them. That will get us into the business of time zones and locales. And finally, we'll look at the ways that you can measure process execution times. Now, the purpose of this slide is not to scare you away, but to point out that there are several representations of time in Linux. Some, like the time t and the tm structure that you see here, are binary representations, and some, like the ones in the top row, are human readable text. The time t is important. It's the same representation of time that we saw in the timestamps within a file's inode, back in Lesson 3. Now most of these representations deliver one second resolution, but the time val structure, shown here on the right, has an extra field, giving microsecond resolution. As you can see, there are functions for converting between these different representations. And by the way, I should acknowledge that this diagram was heavily influenced by one in Michael Kerisk's excellent book on Linux systems programming. A good place to start is the time function, which returns the current time as a time t. Here it is. The return value is the number of seconds since a moment in time known as the epoch, which is the very first instant of the year 1970 in UTC. From the command line, I can retrieve this value using the date command. Now, if you did this at the same time as me, then wherever in the world you might be, and whatever language you speak, you would get the same value, to the extent that our computer's clocks are actually right. But if you asked me what time it was, and I said it was 142581 you'd probably not find that very helpful. On a 64-bit system, a time t is a 64-bit integer, and it's able to represent times so far into the future that the human race will be long past caring. But on a 32-bit system, the time t will overflow in 2038. So it's possible that there will be some embedded 32-bit systems still around by then, which might run into trouble. Even if a time t is 64 bits, legacy applications might still store it in 32-bit fields. Let's look at a rather more useful representation of time, called broken down time, which is stored in a TM structure. Now, the functions GM time and local time both take as input a pointer to a time T, and they return a pointer to a TM structure containing the broken down time. The difference between them is that GM time returns the time in UTC, the GM stands for the old Greenwich Mean time, whereas local time returns the time in the local time zone. Let's have a look at the TM structure. Most of it's fairly self-explanatory. This first field is the time in seconds. The value goes from 0 to 60, rather than 0 to 59, as you might expect, to allow for leap seconds. Minutes past the hour and hour of the day is fairly straightforward, as is day of the month, the month of the year, and the year. Now, there's clearly some redundancy in this structure here, in that some of the fields are deducible from the others, so the day of the week and the day in the year fall into that category. And finally, there's a flag to say whether daylight savings time is in effect. I'd like to present a program now that brings together quite a number of the things that we've learned so far. This program does a recursive directory traversal. That's something that we've not attempted before. For each file it encounters, it gets the last modification timestamp and it converts it into a broken down time. It uses the hours field of this to build a histogram showing how many files were modified based on the hour of the day.
So here's the code. Now there's quite a lot of this. It's easily the most complicated program I've presented in this course. And for those of you who have a plus subscription at Plural Sight, I'd strongly recommend that you download the, uh, the demo tarball and have a look at this code in detail on your own machine. But I'll talk you through a few of the highlights here. This global array here called mod time hist modification time histogram is where we're going to build our hour by hour histogram of file modification times this method here starting at line 15 is responsible for processing a single file whose name is passed in as an argument um, it does a stat on the file here we're interested in the modification time coming back from that stat call and we convert it to a broken down time in the local time zone. And then line 27, which I guess is really the heart of the whole program, is where we build the histogram. We increment the appropriate bin of the histogram based on the hour of the time's last modification. That will obviously be a value between naught and 23. So we do this for every file. Let me scroll down. Beginning at line 30 here, we have a function called process dir. Now I've broken this out into a separate function here because I want to be able to call it recursively. It's passed the full name, the full path name of the directory as argument. Uh, we've seen this code before. It does an open dir on it, and then it traverses the directory by calling a read dir to pull out the file names one by one. We have a flag here called a flag that's set by the minus a command line option that says if we want to process hidden files and begin with a dot. And if we don't, and the file does begin with a dot, we just skip round to the next iteration of the loop. Now we're trying to deal with absolute path names all the time here, so this little bit of string manipulation here is to take the full path name of the directory, uh, add a slash onto the end, and then the name of the file that we've just pulled out from that directory to build the absolute path name of the file. Scroll down a little further. This piece of code here is a little tricky. This is the recursive call on process dir. The idea here is that we can recurse down in an, into an entire subtree of the file system. We do not want to recurse on dot or on dot dot. We only want to recurse if the r flag boolean is set. That's set from the minus r command line option. And Importantly, we only want to recurse if the file that we're looking at is actually a directory. If all those conditions are met, we make the recursive call to process the subdirectory. Otherwise, we just call process file to process it as a regular file. We're careful to close the directory handle when we're done. Uh, if we don't do that, we will run out of handles if we're traversing uh, a large piece of the file system. Now scrolling down to look at main, its job is really just to kick things off. We begin by clearing out the modification time histogram here. Here's our command option processing. We're just recognizing two flags, minus A which sets A flag and minus R which sets R flag. We're then expecting one further argument, which is the name of the directory we want it to operate on. So we check that, we print out a usage error message uh, if the user hasn't provided that. This code here, beginning at line 93, uh, is making sure that the directory name we've got is a full path name. If it already begins with a forward slash, then it is already a full path name. Otherwise, what we need to do is to get the current directory name 
append a forward slash and then the name of the argument that the user provided to convert this into a full path name. And then we make the top level call onto process dir passing in that directory name. When all that's done, we simply loop over the 24 bins of the histogram displaying their values. Let's try running this program. Now I'm in my home directory here. So we'll run it on this directory here, which is the top level directory that contains all of the source code for this course. I'll pipe the output into less. Now there are a couple of printfs in the uh, code to trace the entry into each directory and to each file. So you'll see from this first line here that it has correctly constructed the full path name of the directory I want. And then here are the individual entries from that directory. They are themselves all directories, in fact, but since we haven't specified the minus R option, it doesn't recurse down into them. And then we see the, uh, the histogram being printed out. Uh, if we look in there, we'll see what four, five, six, seven entries corresponding to those seven directories. Let's try adding in the minus A option. There's not a lot of difference except that it does now process the dot dot and the dot directories. And if we look at the histogram, we'll see that there are five, six, seven, eight, nine entries there, two more than before. But the more interesting run, of course, is with the minus R option, the recursive option. Now we see a much longer list of names. We see it recursing down into each of the subdirectories and processing every file in the entire subtree. And then down at the bottom, if we look at the histogram, uh, it looks like I'm particularly active between uh, 7 and 8 in the morning. That's the largest entry in the histogram by far, which doesn't surprise me. That's a nice quiet time when I find I can get quite a bit of work done. Just to repeat, I would encourage you to uh, download the source code for this program if you have a plus subscription, examine it, compile it and run it for yourself.